So back in the 80s, there was a movie that came out called Mask, M-A-S-K, and it was the true story of a young man named Rocky Dennis. Lou, go ahead and pull up the slide. So this is Rocky. Rocky was an absolutely incredible man. He was kind and thoughtful. He was one of the coolest people you would ever know. But most people didn't get to know him because of the way he looks. Now, there's a name for the condition that he had, but most people know it as elephant man syndrome. And it's where calcium builds up, continually to builds up uh, on, your, on the skull of your body, which is which is causes the deformities that he has. So needless to say, Rocky was bullied as a young kid and continued to be bullied most of his life. And one of the things that came along with this condition is blindness. But he didn't have total blindness. He had, he was legally blind, but he still could see some things. And the one thing that he absolutely loved beyond anything else was to go to summer camp, because he went to camp for the blind, which means all of the kids could not see him. And there, he was an eagle. They didn't hear what he looked like on the outside because they couldn't see it. They only got to know him by who he was on the inside. And he said he could not wait every year to go to camp because that was the one time that he could really show who he was and people would not judge him. <coughs> well, one summer, there was a girl named Diana who Rocky got kind of smitten with. He was really interested in her. And Diana returned the favor, too. So they were really getting to know each other. And one day, Diana said to Rocky, she was born blind, so she had never had any sight. And she was trying to understand the concept of color. People would talk about color, and she was, that didn't mean anything to her. She had no frame of reference for color. So this one particular day, Rocky brings her into the, the kitchen, and he wants, to, wants her to experience the color. And so I want you to experience what Diana went through. You can choose to do it or not, but we'll try it. So what I want you to do is to sit with your hands out in front and if you will, you can or not, you can close your eyes so you can have the experience of Diana. Now, if you close your eyes, remember you're supposed to not know what color looks like, right? So now Rocky has gone into her, in the freezer and he's brought out a rock that he's had there for a day. And he puts it in your hand. So immediately you have this cold, hard rock in your hand. And so your natural inclination may be to pass it back and forth because it's, off, it's so cold you probably can't hold it. And then he looks at her and says, this is green. And then he goes to the refrigerator and he pulls out a lime. And now he puts this in your hand. So you have this lime, this very soft fruit in your hand. And he says, smell it. And so you smell it. And he says to her, this is green. So now you have an experience of blue and you have an experience of green. And then he goes over to the pot where he's got a boiling pot of water and there's a rock in there. And so now he's taken that rock out and now he puts this in your hand. You've got this very, very hot rock in your hand. So you're probably wanting to go back and forth with your hands because it's just going to be too hot. And Rocky says, this is red. And as it goes back and forth in your hands, it begins to cool off. And he says, now it's pink. And then Rocky brings a piece of cotton ball. Now you have a cotton ball in your hand. And that cotton ball, he says, this is billowy. It is white billowy. This is what the clouds in the sky look and feel like. And she begins to feel the texture of the cotton ball. And she says, I think I'm beginning to understand. And then he takes her hand. He touches her face with it. So touch your face. And he says, this is beautiful. He let her appearance. He let her experience color. But had she known what he looked like, would she have allowed him to do what he had done? My guess is probably not. 
And how many times do we look at somebody and we immediately dismiss them and think, well, there's nothing I can learn from them because they do not meet my expectations. So that's what Paul is talking about in his letter today. You see, he's gotten a letter from the church at Corinth, and this letter is in response to them. So the church in Corinth, they only know what they know, and they are being ruled by the Romans, and the Romans say there is a hierarchy. There are people that are more important than other people, and so they bring that into the church. Well, surely there are more people, certain people in the church must be more important than the others. And Paul writes back and says, no, nobody in the church is more important. You are the body of Christ, and if you are the body of Christ, then how can the eye say to the foot, you are not important? And so if we take what Paul says as seriously, then we have no idea how we are the body of Christ. We have no idea what our role is as the body of Christ. Perhaps we are the nose here of the body of Christ. Doesn't sound real elegant, but it has a necessary role, right? So here we are living out the body of Christ, not knowing who we are or what it is we're supposed to be doing. But as a, as a community, Paul is saying to this community, not every church is going to have every single role. So what if, as a cluster of churches, this church is given this gift, and this church is given this gift, and your church is given this gift, and together, as a community, you make up the body of Christ. Now, this church puts on awesome rummage sales, right? We are known as the rummage sale church. But if you go five miles down the road to St. Paul's, when they try to put on a rummage sale, they became. Now, it doesn't mean that they did it wrong and we did it right. That may just not be the gift that they need to do. And how many times have you gone someplace and say, oh, this church is doing this, we should come and do that. But maybe that's not our gift. Maybe that's not what we are asked to do. Because we are in community with our sister churches, and together we make the body of Christ. All right, then we turn it to the, to the next slide. So if we are going to recognize our own gifts, then we must be vulnerable. We must need each other. So see if you can answer any of these questions. You can answer yes. Is it okay to need another person's help? How many of us go, yeah, I don't want anybody else to me. I don't want anybody to know my issues. Or all I need, I can provide. Thank you very much. I'm very good. Or how about, I have to read this one. It makes me uncomfortable to ask for help. How many of us have said that? Don't ask me for help. I will offer when I can. Or I must be close to death before asking for help. You see, we need each other. And that's what Paul is saying as he talks about the body of Christ. The eye needs the leg. We need each other to be in community together. And the next slide is a quote from Martin Luther Jr., who we just celebrated on Monday. He says, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. Whatever affects one directly and for affects all indirectly. I see you on Sunday mornings as Pastor Steve or I lead the list of prayer concerns, or the first time you hear that someone's in the hospital or something has happened. You can literally physically watch this whole body just hold them up in prayer. Oh no, we have to pray for them. We have to be thinking about them. That's the body of Christ. It's when we're not afraid to share our pain. I can remember when I lost my first child to a miscarriage, and the doctor said, one in five women will miscarry. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of people. And I remember that first time at church, coming to church, and a woman coming up to me who I had known for 15 years started to tell me her story. And before I left church that day, there were seven women who told me their story. There was no reason for the need to tell me.
tell them their story before now, but now here was somebody who is walking this journey and saying, I get it. I'm here for you. I understand what you're going through. That's the body of Christ. You see, Christ doesn't have a physical body here anymore. We are the hands. We are the feet. We are the body of Christ. Even in our brokenness, especially in our brokenness, we become the body of Christ. How many people would have experienced what Diana experienced from Rocky if maybe he had looked different? We'd say, oh, of course, we're going, we're going to, to follow this man because look how handsome he is. But if you realize it, that the most important part of our body is not the part that we rise, that we take care of the most. The most important of our body to keeping us alive is internal. My hair is not going to make a difference between my life and death, but my internal organs will. And yet we spend more time working on this part of our body than maybe focusing on what's happening internally in our body. We are a community. And when that community comes together, not based on race, not based on gender. When we come together, then we are unity in our diversity versus unity in our universality. Now there's this game called Jenga. I've been practicing this, so let's see if this works. All right, so there's this game called Jenga, if you've ever played it. And the idea is, that you start pushing out pieces of this puzzle. And as they come out, the last person who pushes one out and all falls down loses. So it's kind of neat because everybody wins, only one person loses versus one person winning and everybody loses. So if this is the body of Christ, and I begin to push out parts of the body, like patience. So maybe I'm giving up patience because it really person is really on my last nerve. Or perhaps I give up wisdom. Or perhaps Thanks be to God.